Well, hello everyone and welcome to For the Love of Animals, a presentation of Pinellas County Animal Services and Inspiration 1110 AM. I'm your host, Len Sosinski from the Pinellas County Communications Department. For the Love of Animals is a celebration of our connection and commitment to all things animal related in the Tampa Bay area. And during the next hour, we'll be sharing with you information about the animals we love and the services and programs provided by Pinellas County Animal Services. But first, Hollywood loves cats and dogs. You can't go wrong with a cute canine or a cuddly kitten as the star of your next motion picture. And just about everybody has a favorite dog or cat movie. With me today to talk about famous canines in the movies is Adoptions, Rescues, and Fosters coordinator and film critic for Pinellas County Animal Services, Tyson Utes. Tyson, how are you? Hello, I want to yell action. Yeah, action is right. Action, let's go. Well, you know, um, we're usually so serious on this program. We have a lot of serious topics to discuss all the time, and I wanted to take a little break from all that and just have a little fun with the audience for a little bit. So we're going to spend some time. What I've done here is, uh, you know, I've consulted the Internet, and there are a lot of uh, surveys out there, a lot of public opinion out there, but I put together, based on Internet input and based on my own personal preference, I have to admit that, the top ten dog and cat movies of all times... And I want to discuss that with you today. Yeah, there were more than 10. There were more there than 10, so but these, movies these are the top 10. So we want to see if the dogs and cats in these movies act like dogs and cats in real life or how much acting went on on their part. So let's get the list started here. Okay. Uh, top 10 uh, hit number 10 is All Dogs Go to Heaven. Now, that was an animated film, so I guess you can make dogs do anything in uh, animated film. But do you remember those films? Do you remember what the dogs were, what they, the breeds they were supposed to be? I do remember, and I remember going to see All Dogs Go to Heaven. That was uh, uh, quite a fun, uh, a fun movie. Uh, the star of that one... His name was Charlie B. Barkin. Okay. And he had several other friends with uh, interesting name street names of Itchy and I think uh, Carface or something like that. There's uh -huh. really interesting names that they had with those. Uh, but Charlie in that movie uh, sure does look like a shepherd mix. All right. And there's a lot of shepherd mixes that are in the shelter, and we've got mm -hmm. a couple of them there even, even now. But Charlie was portrayed to be a very uh, intelligent and... Uh, I can't say manipulative, but a very versatile dog. If dogs can talk, they're usually intelligent. Yes, they sure are. And some dogs sure do make you think they can talk. <laughs> they just don't want to talk to us. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so that's that's the top ten, number ten. So working from the list from ten to number one, number nine on the list, Benji. We all remember Benji. And that was an incredible movie franchise. Uh, and it said in the in the notes that he, uh, Benji was a mixed breed. But w was Benji a, a dog? He looked like a regular dog, like a Benji was a mixed breed. He was from okay. a, uh, from an animal shelter. Okay, uh, but this was long enough ago that he was from an animal shelter that didn't spay or neuter the animals before they let them out. So Benji actually f had a child, and that child ended up uh, starring in another Benji movie. Okay. And then after that, there was a remake of Benji, and that dog was actually on a big nationwide star search for a shelter dog to use for that. The dog that played the original Benji was also in a very old TV series. I can't say very old because I enjoyed that series. Petticoat Junction. And oh, he no appeared kidding. in that, was that the, the same dog, dog from Petticoat that, that Junction. That his face over the water tower. That was Benji. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Well, of course, in the movie Benji, the first, the initial Benji, uh, once again, we had uh, the dogs helping out humans, uh, apparently uh, including two ki uh, children that were kidnapped and held for ransom, and the dog was instrumental in, in uh, releasing those children and re reuniting the family again. Everybody lived happily ever after, as is usually what happens in a dog movie. Number eight on the list, Turner and Hooch. Now, it says here on my notes that Turner was a dog de Bordeaux. What kind of a dog is that? Uh, yes, but I think Hooch was a dog. Oh, Hooch was. Okay. <laughs> Turner, right, was, Turner Tom was Tom Hanks. So uh, let's uh, not insult Tom Hanks here. Oh, uh, actually, that uh, was a very noble breed of dog. And the the French of uh, uh, dog de Bordeaux, and pardon the pronunciation, or pardon my French, um, it actually means Mastiff of Bordeaux. So it's a French Mastiff, okay. and it's a type of, of, of Mastiff. And there's several different kinds of, of Mastiff. That breed is one of the oldest French breeds. I, don't think you have to, I do think you'd be hard-pressed to find an older French breed. It is a slobbery dog. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a dog that was well portrayed in the movie because many of its um, uh, behaviors were very common with, with the breed. But please do not, like they did in the movie, allow your dog to drink alcohol. That oh, is my goodness. never a good thing. But 
we do get Mastiff mixes in the shelter pretty frequently as well. And frequently, Mastiffs, although they look like they are extremely large and extremely active, well, they're large. They're not always yeah, very active. Yeah. Well, in this movie, apparently the dog really turned Tom Hanks' life upside down, but in the end, uh, he was led to romance with a town veterinarian. Yes, he was. Because of the dog, so that worked out pretty well for everybody involved. All right, number seven on the list, Marley and me. Who is Marley? Well, Marley was a yellow Labrador retriever, mm -hmm. a beautiful dog, and uh, that is a, the most popular breed of dog in the country. Because there are so many yellow Labrador retrievers uh, out there, it's invariably going to happen that we're going to get them in our shelter and we get lots and lots of, of retriever and Labrador retriever uh, mixes. Uh, there are several in there at any given moment. Uh, was a very pretty dog mm -hmm. and uh, the yellow coloration was very light so it made it easy to see the dog's eyes. We get all, all the time comments in the shelter of, uh, well I really like this dog more so than this dog. People tend to gravitate toward the lighter dogs because it's easier to see their eyes. And we're so uh, conditioned to look into the eyes and fall in love. One look into her eyes, I fell in love. And Marley and me, it was easy to fall in love with that dog, with, that, with the light coat and those deep, dark brown eyes. That dog could have gotten away with anything it wanted, and well, people would have stayed and, in love. And, of course, if people recall the movie, the dog was a bit recalcitrant. Uh, he got kicked out of uh, dog training classes and everything else and, and grew up with the family. You know, the family went through a lot of uh, different things, and, and at the end, actually, the dog got sick. Yes. It Very was sad moment there. Extremely so, but they are uh, one of the best breeds uh, for families. Okay, number six on the list. Uh, we have a cat movie here, kind of a cat and a dog movie. Not too many cat movies on the list, but uh, number six on the list is The Adventures of Milo and Otis. What an amazing motion picture that one was. That one was, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, I've seen that one several times. My children have enjoyed it. And just one that is a classic, and it will always be a classic. Uh, it was interesting that both a dog and a cat would partner up best friends uh, in that movie to travel such a long distance well you know that was so funny because I saw the movie my niece at the time was six years old and she just loved that movie so we went to see the movies and of course Milo and Otis they have all these traveling adventures they go to the forest they go to the seashore they go up in the mountains and I'm wondering where on the planet earth is a place that has such varied terrain within an hour's walk from home but that's the movies for well, you we don't have any mountains here in uh, Pinellas County but but so the, the cat was an orange tabby, and who was the dog in that movie? The, the dog was a pug, a fawn pug, and it is a very popular breed right now. And pretty much if you want to cause everyone to want a certain breed of dog, you just make a movie about it. Sure. Like, well, just name a movie. If there's a dog in it, it became very popular because of the movie. Pugs uh, became extremely popular due to the more recent Men in Black movies. Mm -hmm. uh, that with the talking pug. Uh, everybody wanted a pug. We get frequent requests for them. Now, uh, due to some designer breeds, uh, the pugs are being combined with beagles very frequently. So we're actually seeing uh, pug-beagle mixels, which are called puggles, huh. uh, coming into the shelter a little more often now. Now, the orange tabby, uh, most orange cats are boys. Oh, okay. Almost 90%, maybe even a little higher. But most orange cats end up being boys. And most of the orange cats that are boys are just really, really affectionate and friendly. You hear that all the time from everyone that owns an orange tabby cat, how adorable they are. And that these two, do or that these two friends, uh, Milo and Otis, work so well together was incredible because – Hollywood uh, animal wranglers will tell you frequently that it's hard to get different species of animals to tolerate each other for such a long period of time in the film. And I understand they had to shoot hours and hours and hours of film and edit it together to get that movie made. Lots of retakes and lots of treats. I suspect that uh, Milo and Otis may have gotten uh, rather portly by the end of that movie, being enticed by treats to behave in lots of different ways. When they do a movie like that, do they have different dogs and cats to play the different roles, or do they stick with one pair? Frequently, frequently they do. In some of the movies that we'll talk about in the, uh, in the next segment, ah. uh, you'll hear um, that not only will they have different dogs, they'll have different genders of dogs that you didn't expect. All right, so those are the top five movies from our top ten movies, and we will be back a little later on on the program to count down the rest of that top ten. But right now, we're going to visit with Dr. Caroline, who shares some advice on traveling with dogs. That when we come back. 
And we're back. Welcome back to For the Love of Animals, a presentation of Pinellas County Animal Services and Inspiration, 1110 AM. I'm Len Sazinski with the Pinellas County Communications Department. For most people, pets are part of the family. They're included in everything, all family activities, including going on vacation or traveling to visit friends. But is taking a dog along for the ride a good idea, or would it be best to leave him at home? And if you travel with a pet, what are some precautions to take to ensure a pleasant journey for everyone? Well, with me today to share some advice on the subject is Dr. Caroline, Director of Veterinary Services for Pinellas County Animal Services. Dr. Caroline, hello. Hi, Len. How good are you? Good morning to you. <laughs> Welcome to you. Well, thank you. Once good again, to you. good to have you sitting over there in that chair. Uh, it's travel. It's still travel season in America. People all over America are traveling to and fro, and uh, a lot of them want to take their pets uh, with them when they travel. Uh, is that a good idea, or would, would pets rather stay at home rather than go on vacation? Well, that's an excellent question, and I think that really depends on the individual family and the pet. I was just reading that one in five uh, families travels with their pet, particularly their dogs. And so for a lot of people, it's a really, really good option. It keeps the family together. Um, I think a lot of that's dependent on the pet themselves, though. How well do they handle travel in a car or travel on a plane and being away from home? And some pets tolerate that very well and others don't. So I think that really needs to factor in where is your pet most comfortable, some, with you or at, or at the house? Some get off on the excitement of travel. Others uh, are homebound uh, for the most part. But, for okay, let's talk about traveling in cars, though. We mentioned that. And most dogs seem to travel well in cars. Uh, so let me ask you, uh, should we... Uh, embark on any precautions with the dogs? Do we let him ride in the back of the pickup? Do we let him ride with his head out the window? Or do we strap him in like a, like a three-year-old? Well, I think the safest place for your pets to ride, if, if they're well-behaved, is to ride in, in the vehicle and using a safety harness that they sell in a lot of pet stores in the event that you'd be in some sort of uh, car crash or something along the way. You know, we hate to think about that, but that's a possibility. Really don't think that them riding in the back of the pickup truck is a good idea. And we do occasionally see see dogs that, you know, they're riding with their head out the window, they see something exciting and they launch themselves out, sometimes even on the interstate. And so for the safety of your pet, maybe having that window crack so they can smell those exciting smells, but making sure that in case they see something really interesting that they're prevented from going out after it. And I understand if you have a loose dog in the car, you have to be very careful about opening the car door, say at a rest stop along the way or, or at a toll booth. If you can't reach the toll booth, you know, you have to open the car door to reach the toll uh, receptacle. That dog can can zip out, and if you're far from home, if you're 100 miles away from home, that could be a real problem. It really can, and a lot of those areas you mentioned are, are right near major roads, so the chance that that animal that gets away um, is going to get hit by a car or injured is very high. There's also a danger for any animal that's loose in the vehicle. If they interfere with you as you're trying to drive or potentially try and crawl down by your feet where the gas and the brake pedals are um, or try and interfere with your hands when you're steering, that can, that can cause some major safety issues. And so your pet really should be restrained, should have a leash and collar on, should be wearing a collar with tags with your phone number and your address so in case your pet does get loose, they can get it back to you. Ideally, it should be microchipped as well. Uh, all of those can be precautions to make sure that everybody stays safe. You know, we got an email recently from somebody in Orlando who uh, had found a loose dog with a with a collar, like with a tag, and the tag related back to a Pinellas County address. So they were trying to get in touch with the uh, with with the pet owner. But this is a, a case where somebody's dog got loose in Orlando. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they found it. Hopefully they were reunited. But sometimes those stories don't have happy endings. That's true. And if that dog had, in addition to its license tag, been wearing an identification tag with the owner's cell phone number, that person person who found the dog could have easily called the owner and gotten that dog right back to the owner. It would have been much more simple. So wearing the license and an ID tag is so important. Also having a microchip just in case that collar and tags comes off. Make sure that information is up to date as well. Do dogs get car sick, or, or how often should you just stop for a potty break with a dog in the car? Well, to answer your first question, some dogs get very, very car sick. And so if your dog is one of those that gets car sick, uh, your veterinarian has some really, really great medications to help prevent car sickness. Also making sure you don't feed your dog a lot of food right before you get in the car can be really important. Um, as far as stopping for potty breaks, that's going to be really dependent on your individual pet. You know, many pets can hold their, you know, hold their 
um, their potty stuff, you know, for several hours. Usually they'll give you an indication um, that they need to stop. But stopping probably every couple hours so that you can all get out and stretch your legs and use the bathroom is a good idea. Because sometimes they're not going to give the same signals in the car that they would at home. And I would imagine it helps to burn off a little excess energy, too, getting the dog out and running around a little bit before they get back in the car for the remainder of the trip. Definitely. What about traveling on commercial carriers, ships or buses or planes? I understand it's very problematic, like if you're flying someplace with an animal, a lot of, lot of considerations there. There are, and that's where you really need to be in touch with whatever transportation carrier you're going to be traveling on to make sure that you're following all regulations in regards to traveling with your pet. There tend to be regulations as far as what kind of restraint or carrier that your pet needs to be in. Sometimes you have to pay extra to travel with your pet. Often you need a veterinary certificate from your veterinarian saying it's okay for your pet to fly. And sometimes you need an acclimation letter letter as well, especially if your pet is too large to, to stay in the cabin of the plane and mm-hmm. needs to go down in cargo. Uh, so all of those things need to be considered, and you really need to make sure you're in line with your transportation carrier. Because the last thing you want to do is show up, you know, getting ready to travel, and then tell you that, you know, you didn't meet all the requirements and you can't go. If we leave our dog at home, and it sounds like mm-hmm. talking to you that that may be the more pragmatic choice, but if we leave our dog at home, what should we do with it? I mean, the choices are taking it to a kennel, you know, board it in a kennel, having a friend come over to take care of the animal, or taking the animal to a friend's house to stay with a friend while we're away on vacation. Which of those choices would be best for the animal? I think it, again, all depends on your individual animal and your resources. You know, a lot of people like to have a pet sitter or a friend come over and take care of their pets, um, but often that's a more expensive proposition, especially with dogs. They often need to come over multiple times a day to make sure that your animals um, can go out to go to the bathroom. So sometimes a kennel situation can be more uh, more affordable. The other thing to consider is what kind of medical needs does your pet have? Um, for instance, if your pet is diabetic and needs insulin injections or has other medications that they need to have administered, discussing with your veterinarian to see if your veterinarian can board your pet, um, making sure that those medications are administered, and also watching that pet's health closely while you're gone. So in case any problems do arise, they're addressed right away. And I would imagine that uh, there are some pretty upscale pet resorts. Uh, I don't know if they're in this area or not, but I know nationwide there are some really fancy places that you can board your pet at. Oh, there are. And there's some that have webcams so you can check in and watch your pet. They have have play groups where they can play with other animals. We do have some facilities that have kind of a free range so the animals aren't in, you know, kennels or cages they're able to move around. There's all sorts of different options out there and so getting some recommendations from friends or your veterinarian and also going and visiting the facility, see where your pet's going to be housed. You make sure you're really comfortable with that. It's all advisable when you're choosing a place to board. Sounds like you go on your vacation the pet will have its own vacation at one of these uh, fancy pet resorts. If we do take our pet uh, with us when we get where we're going, whether it's a friend's house we're staying at or a hotel that is a pet-friendly hotel, what are some of the precautions we should take when we get where we're going? I think just making sure that you are keeping a very close eye on your pet, that you're making sure that they aren't able to run out the door, that you're using your leash and collar very carefully because, you know, if a pet gets out at home, we don't want that to happen. But typically they have an idea of the yard and and the neighborhood a little bit. If they're in a completely unfamiliar place, they're not going to be able to get back home. So we want to be extra vigilant to make sure that they don't escape. Also watching closely, there may be new plants or animals or things like that that they're not used to being in contact with on vacation um, and making sure that they're not putting things they shouldn't in their mouth or getting into things like that's also really important. And are they going to be a little anxious being in this new environment? Are there, is their behavior going to be a little more erratic? Uh, it can. Depending on, the, depending on the pet and how well they're socialized and how well they deal with change, we definitely can see behavior changes. So making sure that they're getting lots of good exercise and trying to, you know, especially if you're going to be somewhere for a few days or a week at a time, kind of establish a routine as close to the routine you have at home as far as walks and feeding to help your pet feel really comfortable. And if the pet does run off, that's going to be a real vacation spoiler for, for any family. Oh, yeah, definitely. And so if that does happen, you know, contacting the local animal control or animal services agency where strays would go, also putting up signs. But again, making sure before you go that you've taken those precautions by having an ID tag, you have your microchip registered and up to date with your information so that animal will get back to you. When the dog gets back home again, um, and I I would imagine a lot of animals are really, really glad to be home. Uh, but do they forget that they're home? And do they have to be reacclimated to their home environment? Or do they know they're home when they're home? Most of, 
the time they know that they're home when they're home. So typically reacclimation isn't something we have to worry about, but just making sure, again, once you get home, you're back on that normal routine, just making sure you stick to that routine will really help them get back in, back in the swing of things, especially if they're a new pet to the house. They might not have been in that routine for very long. Well, just get them to send postcards to all the other dogs and cats in the neighborhood, and they'll be fine. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Caroline. She's my guest this time around. Remember, if you have a question for Dr. Caroline, simply email it to us at animals at pinellascounty.org. And we'll have the answer for you on an upcoming edition of For the Love of Animals. Well, coming up after the break, we'll find out more information about the pets we love and some of the important programs provided by Pinellas County Animal Services. You stay with us. And we're back. Welcome back to For the Love of Animals. I'm your host, Len Sazinski from the Pinellas County Communications Department. Well, as promised, with me again is ARF Coordinator for Pinellas County Animal Services, Tyson Utes. And we continue our countdown about famous pet movies. And welcome again, Tyson, back on, on the show. We are down to number five on our greatest dog and cat movies of all time countdown. Number five is one of the greatest Disney films of all time, Lady and the Tramp. There were many breeds in that movie. Uh, she was uh, a spaniel. Tramp was a mix. Yes. He was essentially a, a, a pound puppy. And then there were there was a bloodhound and a mm -hmm. Scottish terrier oh boy. and on and on. And then there were the... Um, very irritating pair of Siamese that had that song that was I, so irritating. I remember, I recall, yes. <laughs> yeah, those, uh, those animals actually um, portrayed animal sheltering as a bad experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, that well, movie portrayed it as it a bad experience. It was a long experience. time ago. It was, and things were different in those days where adoptions did not have the uh, desire and the, and the public support that they do now. Now we're able to communicate with people through movies and videos and radio to communicate the importance of adopting and spaying and neutering. So a shelter's not such a um, scary place after all. Yeah, yeah, and of course the climax of that movie is when Mutt uh, kills a rat, protects the baby who is being menaced by a rat in the house. Uh, Which is very common for terriers. I mean, there's even a rat terrier. Mm -hmm. Rat terriers, Jack Russell terriers, Cairn terriers, and, and on and on. Terriers tend to be considered uh, preeminent um, little rat dogs that will that will uh, destroy rats in so, barns. So, except for the fact that all the dogs could talk, uh, the, the, peop the talk, dogs in the movies pretty much have followed the same characteristics as the dogs of their breed in real life. Pretty much. There's always exaggerations. Of course. That's what it's Hollywood's job is to do, is to uh, sensationalize it. All right, number four on our list of the top ten movies of all times, Dogs and Cats, another Disney film, 101 Dalmatians. 101 Dalmatians is... A very enjoyable movie. The breed, though, is not necessarily the same as what was portrayed in that movie. Well, how did Dalmatians get to be firehouse dogs? You know, I've been to a lot of firehouses in Pinellas County, and none of them have Dalmatians. Well, it was somewhat of a uh, stereotype at one point. They were often kept in, in firehouses to uh, ride uh, w on the fire trucks. Remember, the original fire trucks, though, were horse and carriage. Mm -hmm. And Dalmatians were horse and carriage dogs. Ah. So it was just assumed that it would be a natural dog to go with the horse and carriage uh, fire engine uh, going to put out a fire. So Dalmatians just evolved into that. It was very interesting that they, that they did that. Of course, then you had uh, the uh, antagonist, the Cruella de Vil, and... Uh, she was not such a nice person, but her driving made you laugh. Well, you know, they had some uh, incredible plot lines in some of these movies. Here in 101 Dalmatians, the dogs foil a plot to produce dog skin fur coats. Uh, what will they think of next? Well, it, yeah, that was such a silly thing. That would never be allowed. But, uh, you know, we took it so seriously when we were kids watching this movie for the first time. Absolutely. You see things in, in movies, and they can you know make big changes in your life. I mean... Sad, sad parts in movies where animals uh, sacrifice themselves to well, save their owners. And you we have, always remember that. We have one of those coming up. But first, let me go through uh, movie number three. We're up to number three here on our list of movies. Uh, Beethoven, a big St. Bernard, or actually a St. Bernard puppy that grew up to be a big St. Bernard, once again uh, works his way into the hearts of the family. And this one survives. He survives a plot to use St. Bernard dogs as ammunition testers. I'm not sure I know what that is, but that was the part of the plot of the movie. Well, then Beethoven uh, was just a very fun dog, and he was a clown, and he just looked big and goofy. But he was a very trainable dog. Now, that breed of dog was used for a horror movie 
as well. And we'll talk about that coming up a little later on, <laughs> the bad side of the St. Bernards. But what did they carry around their neck? Now, St. Bernards stereotypically had the brandy. Stereotypically, they had a brandy around their neck. And you'd see in some of the Looney Tunes um, uh, cartoons that he'll, that the St. Bernard will take the avalanche victim and actually mix the drink for them. <laughs> and that's very funny and very silly. But that was, they were to carry, uh, they carried the uh, alcohol so that if an avalanche victim uh, did get buried and a St. Bernard was used to uh, unearth them the alcohol i suppose was used to warm them uh, warm up, them up bit, yeah. or uh you know it's hard to freeze alcohol so maybe it helped thaw them so so they were used as uh, rescue dogs uh in countries with that terrain initially absolutely they were developed by monks even oh. to help uh, uh weary travelers okay all right let's go to number two on our list of the all-time greatest pet movies of all time old yeller now tyson you're gonna have to help me through with this now who did not cry when they shot old yeller I just push stop before I get to that part in the DVD. <laughs> or, or Pick it up VHS. afterwards. Yeah, don't don't go through that scene. Well, and and actually, it underscores a, a lesson for modern times. If Old Yeller had his uh, was up on his shots and his rabies vaccinations, he would still be with us today. Very true. And of uh, course, if people don't recall the movie, what the, the reason that he gets shot is because he gets bit by a rabid fox. He's trying to protect the family from a rabid fox, and then the boy, of course, has to shoot the dog because that was the only strategy at the time. At that point, the dog was suffering and was a threat to them, and they they did not have a choice. And there are, I mean, that rabid dogs have played uh, sometimes wildly exaggerated roles in some films. I mean, what, what kind of a dog was Old Yeller? Uh, Old Yeller. Uh, did we mention that? No, it looks like a yellow lab or okay. some sort of a retriever. And uh, in that same vein, there was another dog that unfortunately was shot in the. Uh, very old movie had a big impact on me, and that was to kill a mockingbird. Oh yeah! Uh, just to see that that uh, young child see that his dad had to make such a harsh and difficult decision, and that was a stray dog. Old Yeller was not a stray dog, but true. Uh, rabies vaccines at that time were not in common usage. But what Disney knew how to do it, didn't he? I mean, he he touched all the emotions, made you laugh, made you cry, made you scream in horror. He uh, was a master at that. A super genius. And Tyson, that brings us to the number one favorite pet movie of all time. Can you guess what it is? Oh, you know what it is because you've seen the list in advance. Well, let me share the information with everybody out there. And the number one movie of all time, Cat and Dog, Lassie Come Home. Lassie Come Home. And yes. of course, the, all the Lassie movies, all the Lassie TV shows. Uh, back in those days, collies were the be-all and the end-all dog for anybody to have as a pet. They were the uh, shepherding dog that was so easy to train that they could get the dog to do just about anything. And they could actually rescue little boys and girls from wells, from falling into wells, I guess. Well, I think if you read the Far Side cartoon, they're translating it as, what, you pushed little Timmy down the well? <laughs> and no, oh, a collie please. would never, never do that. Of course not. And actually, a, um, a, a type of dog like that, the Shetland Sheepdog, or Sheltie, which is like a very small uh, collie, um, actually saved me. I, uh -huh. as a very young child, was running out into the street, and the dog grabbed me by the seat of my pants and held on until my parents got to the curb to grab me. Oh, for heaven's sakes. So, so you owe your life to this little dog. I certainly do. Now, all of the dogs named Lassie were males. They uh, were yeah. all boys. Amazingly. And they. I it, was shocked it, when I first learned that as a child. And if you have a Lassie with, uh, if you have a dog named Lassie, if that's the registered AKC name, you're not allowed to have that as the dog's name legally unless it is a direct descendant of one of the um, progenitors of that Are there a lot of star. collies out there? I don't really recall seeing any at Animal Services lately. There are not a lot of them out there uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, because collies are such a good type of shepherding dog, they typically will not uh, wander. They will not mm -hmm. stray. A beagle, they want to go sniff everything, mm -hmm. they'll wander. Huskies, they like to wander because that's they like to get out and run. Uh, collies, border collies, Shetland sheepdogs or shelties, uh, any dog in that herding or working group, uh, they want to stay near their um, tasked area so where their they don't owner wants them to be. Rarely. Yeah. It's very rare. All right. That is uh, our top ten. We have some honorable mentions. While we have just a couple of minutes here in the program, we want to talk about these honorable mentions. And one that we talked about already, uh, Tyson, uh, talking about St. Bernard's and talking about rabies, is, of course, the horror movie Cujo from the mind of Stephen King. Yes. Stephen King's just 
a strange person. <laughs> and it, and it was it was a man, horrifying but... movie. It really was. You told me an interesting story about how they had to have kind of stand in uh, St. Bernard's to film that movie. They had to make robots to uh, curl their lip and look vicious and snarling because they couldn't get the St. Bernard in the movie Cujo. I think the dog's name oh, do, the dog's name was uh, Daddy, mm -hmm. um, which Cujo means unstoppable force, and they couldn't get this dog to look vicious or angry, so they had to use stand-in uh, robots to uh, portray it. So how do you like that? Well, that's just uh, the nature of dogs, I guess. All right, another honorable mention, The Cat from Outer Space, another Disney film, and Tyson, you and I are probably the only people on the planet that recall seeing The Cat from Outer Space in the theaters. I loved that movie. That was so much fun. You know, I was I was with the Walt Disney World organization at the time, and we had a big con fab out in California, and I actually saw The Cat from Outer Space, an advanced preview of that movie at the, uh, the Disney production studios in uh, Anaheim, California back in 1978, so it was a big thrill for me. Now, that cat was a uh, Abyssinian. I believe they called it a tawny Abyssinian. It's a very elegant, very large uh, breed of cat. But one of my favorite movie quotes of all time actually came out of that movie, and that was as the as they were falling from the sky, the one gentleman had a parachute, and the person said, but I don't have a parachute. And he said, then you have a problem. And the other person said, but I don't have a parachute either. And the man with the parachute looked at him and said, you have the same problem. It just to me that was... A matter of fact and very genius. Well, let's go through the rest of the list because we are running out of time. The Shaggy Dog, Wizard of Oz with Toto. We've got to mention Toto on TV. We've got some mentions here. Rin Tin Tin, Eddie from Frasier, Comet from Full House, uh, the animated Scooby-Doo. We've got Spuds McKenzie from the beverage uh, commercials. And, of course, Petey from The Little Rascals. Petey from The Little Rascals, the original one, actually had that circle around his eye. It did, wasn't complete, so they actually hired somebody in Hollywood to do, finish the makeup to close that circle, and that person was Max Factor. So well, if you're wearing his makeup, there you have it. The famous you know dog with, with some famous makeup. Well, we've got to go with Tyson. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for being here with us, and uh, thank you to Tyson Utes. Uh, we've been having some fun recalling our favorite pets from the movies. If you've got a favorite TV or movie pet, why not tell us about it? Send us an email to animals at pinellascounty.org, and we'll share it with our audience on a future edition of For the Love of Animals. Animals. Well, coming up after the break, we go to the mailbag to answer some of your questions about cats and dogs when we come back. Well, we're back, and welcome back to For the Love of Animals, a presentation of Pinellas County Animal Services and Inspiration, 1110 AM. I'm your host, Len Szynski, and joining me right now is John Hohenstern, Senior Animal Control Officer at Pinellas County Animal Services. John, how are you this morning? Oh, pretty good, Len. How are you? Good to see you, as always. And once again, we're at the mailbag. And you know, going through the, the mailbag emails, as I do every week, I notice a lot of repeat themes. So, but that's okay. I think uh, good information bears repeat. Repeating and some of these uh, are like variations on a theme, and we right. get a chance to kind of explain these, look at these different ways, and explain all the uh, little different details. So here's the first one. Uh, once again, we're talking about uh, cleaning people cleaning up after their their pets. We talk a lot about that substance here on this show, but uh, but that's all right. <laughs> Dog owners are very very familiar with that product. But here's Tim from Clearwater, and he says, "I have an empty lot next to my house." So this is a little different than some of the emails we've had in the past. This is not his property, rather an empty lot next door. He says some pet owners bring their dogs there to relieve themselves. The pet owners do not clean up after their pets, I guess thinking it's a vacant lot. Who cares? But, he says, the smell is awful. And once again, do pet owners have to clean up after their pets? If so, how do I get the ordinance enforced? Okay, so here's a little variation on a theme. It's not so much pets uh, relieving themselves on my property that, that I have to deal with, and we've talked about that. But here's a vacant lot. It may not belong to anybody. It's kind of in the public domain. Right. And what would be the situation? How could Tim find some relief in this situation? Well, um, well, while there, you know, we don't really have a per se pooper scooper law or whatever. Right. It We've does fall that, yeah. under the public nuisance, um, defecating on the property of others. That's it. All right. So yeah. So it, it doesn't it, matter it if is, it's your property or not. It, yeah, it's a it's nuisance a, if it impacts you in any way. Right. You know, because we get a, also a lot of complaints about you know like condo or apartment. So where there's a lot of common area and people not picking up after mm -hmm. their dogs or whatever, and it's you know the same thing. I mean, you know, maybe just a friendly word, you know, to them say, hey, you know, you are supposed to pick up after your dog. Um, you know, if that doesn't work, if they, they, he can tell us where the dog owners live, 
you know, we'll go out and we can visit them and remind them of their responsibilities. Now, does once again, does Tim have in this email, does he have to uh, write up an affidavit? Does he have to get a neighbor to well, agree? I mean, if if the problem persists and it's, you know, the same people over and over again, uh, and it might get that far. But, you know, I mean, for the most part, once people find out that what they're doing isn't the right thing and it could end up costing them one hundred and forty eight dollars, mm -hmm. you know, if we go through all this process, they're usually pretty compliant. So most people are good people and a uh, reminder from an animal control officer usually does uh, work wonders. Or even sometimes just a friendly word from a neighbor saying, yeah. hey, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of a big mess here or whatever, and I have to live next door to it. All right, know? so Tim is going to have to assert himself a little bit first well, off the bat. Would, you know, we like it when neighbors talk to each other. Yeah. Because if, you know, if I have a problem with you, I would wish you would just come and see me rather than get somebody else involved, you know. Okay, now the next email, I have a little different situation. Here's a gentleman from, uh, I don't know where he's from, someplace in Pinellas County, and he's got multiple problems here, and um, this, is, this is the situation. Apparently there's a gentleman in the, uh, in the neighborhood here who persists in feeding feral cats. Now, people do that. People have big hearts. They see a hungry kitty. They put out some food. They, they'll feed the birds and the squirrels and every other living creature. Right. But he says, the, uh, the emailer says that this has become a problem because now the uh, neighborhood is overloaded with, uh, with, with feral uh, uh, cats. He says they, uh, they defecate all over, causing our properties to stink. They are routinely in the trash dumpsters in the alley. They, and, and so the, the trash is always strewn about as a result. The cats fight, especially at night, creating a noise disturbance. Uh, since they have not had their rabies shots, he says they are presenting a health risk to this community. Now, apparently, he's already contacted the agency. He was told that he needs to get some affidavits. He doesn't want to do that. He wants uh, he wants the gentleman to stop feeding the the, the, the 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 animals. Some way you have to do that, and then he wants every animal control officer to drop what they're doing and grab some giant nets and go <laughs> through the animals, scooping up all the feral cats. Right. Now, what's your take on this situation? Well, you know, like currently we have. 12 officers to cover the entire county and yeah we do ask citizens to shoulder some of the burden if you will to remove the mm -hmm. stray cats from the the neighborhood i mean the first thing that we'll do is we will contact the person feeding the cats. Now, now, can he not feed the cats? Is it illegal for him to feed the cats or the birds or the squirrels or any other thing? Well if by leaving food out you attract Animals, okay. which could be anything. It could be anything. Not rats just not, and everything yeah, else. Not yeah. just the cats, but rats, coyotes. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever. Yeah, that's a public nuisance. You know, I mean, if if he wants to make these cats his own, mm -hmm. he needs to bring them inside and feed them inside and keep them inside. So that's the first part of the equation. Right. Wh whatever whatever somebody is doing animal related that it's creating a nuisance to the neighbors, that can be addressed by you all. Right. We can get out there and we can, you know, it'll be obvious there'll be food bowls in the yard and, you know, what's going on there. And we can advise them, look, you know, just from what we see here, you know, and complaints from your neighbors, we know what's going on, you know. Pick up the bowls, stop feeding the cats, you know, every, you're, you know, the whole neighborhood's upset. If we get another call that you're feeding the cats and we come out here and we see the bowls, I mean, we could cite them, uh, him for maintaining a public nuisance okay. right there and then. And I mean, that's $148 that'd get my attention. So let's say he says, oh, I didn't realize that. Uh, of course, I'll uh, put the uh, animal food back in the pantry and be done with it. Now you still have 500 feral cats in the neighborhood. Well, you know, if, 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 Truly, he is going to stop feeding the cats. We would, you know, ask him to work a trap on his property, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because the cats are used to getting food there. And, you know, we would one by one start removing the cats. Or any of the other neighbors that are affected can get their own traps That's right. and start yep. reducing the feral cat right. population. We'll, we, and we'll come and pick them up Monday through Friday. And once again, though, but these people have to be part of the solution to the problem. Right. You know, we, you know, we can't be everywhere. We can't drop everything that's going on at the time or whatever for, you know, uh, you know, a, a feral cat. Mm -hmm. You know, they are all over, unfortunately. And you know, I, I get a lot of complaints from a lot of people about a lot of different things in my business, and that is a recurrent theme. I mean, people just want to sit back and complain, but I think that it works best when people work with their government to implement a solution that's going to be that's going to protect the rights of the individual without tramping on somebody else's rights. Yeah, it, it helps everyone out. It helps the entire community or whatever because you know we're you know we can't be everywhere at once and see all the violations. So we have to. Work Work together to get uh, the best yeah. solution implemented. All right, here's a, 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 a email from Sharon uh, from Tarpon Springs, and we talked about this earlier on about who owns a pet. 
And she says, I have a dog that I need to register with Pinellas County. She was found on a camping trip. Uh, she was chipped with, uh, from some, uh, the Taylor County Animal Control Agency. Uh, they gave me the number of the owner. She called the owner. He wasn't interested in having the dog back. Now she wants to make the dog hers. So uh, we talked about whoever is registered to the animal owns the animal. But, but how do you transfer a registration from one person to another? Well, I mean, the easiest way is for both the new owner and the old owner to show up at the shelter at the same time and fill out what we call a change of ownership form. Okay. Because that way everybody can be identified and we know that this person is now transferring this property to another person. But here's somebody that apparently lives in Taylor County. So is there some sort of a quit claim, you know, <laughs> that he can do? Well, uh, you know common sense will prevail and what we would probably do is get that person on the phone okay you know maybe even ask them for their driver's license number mm -hmm. you know and over the phone in front of you know someone else at the front desk or you know say okay so you're giving your your dog away to mm -hmm. this gal who found it yeah yeah and that's fine and then transfer the ownership so uh, you want to you want to just be accurate to make sure that whoever says they own the dog indeed does own the dog and everything's uh, right legal. above board. Yeah, yeah. So we, we don't want to take anybody's property away from them. Absolutely. And if there's any kind of a dispute that happens later on, you want to be sure to be able to have the evidence right there and say, well, look, this is what happened. You know, we you were on the phone. You said you were willing to relinquish the dog to this other person. So yeah. Okay. A lot of uh, complaints come in about animal abuse. You know, you've seen tons of those animal abuse, uh, mistreatment of dogs and cats and whatnot. Now, here's somebody who ha wants to lodge a complaint about a veterinarian abusing a dog. And I thought that was very strange. You, you wouldn't think of a veterinarian abusing a dog, but maybe a vet tech, you know, they're, they're having a bad day. And, and, you know, the dogs, when they come into the veterinarian office, they're a little uh, on edge. And, and so maybe she's taking her frustrations out on the dog. But do you see complaints of that nature? And do you get involved? Um, occasionally, there'll be a, a complaint about a vet, but um, they kind of self-regulate themselves. Mm -hmm. The uh, the past president of the uh, Pinellas Veterinary Medical Association is kind of the ombudsman that handles those complaints and looks into it, and that's they're forwarded to the last year's president. And of are they really valid complaints? Uh, yeah, you know. Because sometimes you have to control the animal. Yeah. Sometimes the you animal know, is going to act it, up. The it's animal is going to be fractious, and you know, I mean, yeah. you've got to pr you know protect your staff. I mean, the same thing happens at the shelter sure. too, or whatever. You know, the you know the safety of the staff has to come first. And no matter how nice you think you know Fluffy or Fido is in your own environment, when they're out and about, you know, it could be completely different. So, um, you know, I, I you know. When, once the the complaints have forwarded on, we don't really get the the feedback about mm -hmm. what happens. But you know, we don't hear back from the complainant, so I'd have to say that so, you know it gets resolved satisfactorily. And again, sometimes just explaining the situation to the person that's that's being complained for both the complainant and the complainee, uh, this right. is what happened. This is why it happened, and uh, yeah, it, it may have looked worse than it was. But right. uh, or well, I heard from somebody that was in the waiting room, yeah, you know, yeah. or something. So, okay. So, I, once again, it's good that you guys are out there uh, checking into these things, pet stores, uh, people that have animals at, at bars, you know, or on display some, yeah, some way. Or dining, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, <laughs> yeah, get prepared for a whole new uh, a set of uh, complaints about that. All right, John. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our program here. So thank you very much. John Hohenstern, Senior Control Animal with Pinellas County Animal Services. And you have been listening to For the Love of Animals, presented by Pinellas County Animal Services at Inspiration 1110 AM. Be sure to be with us next Saturday at 11 AM for another episode of For the Love of Animals. And if you have any questions or comments on anything we've talked about on this program, just send us an email at animals at pinellascounty.org or give us a call at area code 727-582-2600. For more information on Pinellas County Animal Services, including photos of the dogs and cats up for adoption this week, go to our website, pinellascounty.org slash animal services. Once again, thanks for listening. I'm Len Sazinski with the Pinellas County Communications Department. Join us next time for the love of animals.